and grew up in a very beautiful location of rolling hills, green, green with grass and summer and, and springtime. At 18, she was caring for the sick and elderly uh, and came to know the Advent faith through one of her patients. Soon afterwards, she was baptised, married not at, at the age of 28 in the Advent faith to Carl Stock and had two daughters, Ruth and Siglinda. In 1957, Ruth and her family, who was known to you all, of course, uh, migrated to Canada, and two years later she followed them and settled in Camp Loops. Now, I don't remember exactly the exact details of this, but uh, I did get a letter from Sister Stock back in 1966 asking me to come to Camp Loops and pay her a visit, which I did. And... Uh, on arrival in Camp, Camp Lips, I found Otto Reese and Ruth and the children up there as well, and all of them accepted the message on, the, on, the, on that visit. And uh, her sister Stock was the very first to embrace the message in Canada, and her daughter Ruth and husband was the second and third at that, at that time. Now, they never looked back on the truth from that day to this and uh, they moved to various locations in Canada until they finally settled just not too far away here at Langley where she resided until her death August 11, 1988. Those who know her, of course, remember a woman of great uh, industry, always working, self-sacrificingly for her family and a very lovely person to know who will miss, will miss her very much. But we do have the glorious hope of the resurrection. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and have someone read from verse 13 down to verse 18. First Thessalonians 4, 13 down to 18. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord, and those that will be with And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Thank you. This is, of course, a very great comfort for the Christian to know that there is a resurrection day coming very shortly. We shall be again with our loved ones and raised to if we die in the meantime. That's a very precious hope to say the least of it. The heathen nations of the world, such as Hindu and Muslim and so forth, do profess to believe in life after death and believe that they do not actually either go to a happy hunting ground of some sort or the other. But when death does come to them, they express tremendous lamentation and sorrow, which shows that they don't find any real comfort in their own teachings. I turn to the Desire of Ages now to read some thoughts from the resurrection of Lazarus, which I find very, very precious and encouraging. Because this resurrection was the hallmark of Christ's divinity, his power to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him. Desire of Ages, page 200 and, well, I've got page 530. And um, we'll take the paragraph which begins with, with Martha answered, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. So I'll go to there, please. Martha answered, I know that he shall rise again. Right. 
life just got to translate into heaven without seeing death. The miracle which Christ was about to perform, raising life from the dead, represents the resurrection of all the righteous dead. By his word and his work, he declared himself the author of the resurrection. He who he himself was soon to die upon the cross, stood with the keys of death, the conqueror of the grave, and asserted his right and power to give eternal life. Thank you. I appreciate the fact that Jesus Christ did not simply say, I, I effect the resurrection, I, 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 I resurrect. He said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Is this more powerful? It's more so. Because in him is life, <clears throat> original, unborrowed and underived. <clears throat> and in the raising of Lazarus, Jesus Christ gave a demonstration of his power to raise the dead and gives us the assurance that we too shall raise at the last day if we die in the meantime. Come now to the last page in the same chapter, page 536. And... Um, We'll take the paragraph which begins, And when he thus had spoken, he cried aloud, loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. His voice, clear and penetrating, pierces the ear of the dead. As he speaks, divinity flashes through humanity. In his face, which is lighted up by the glory of God, the people see the assurance of his power. Every eye is fastened on the entrance to the cave. Every ear is bent to catch the slightest sound. With intense and painful interest, all wait for the test of Christ's divinity, the evidence that is to substantiate his claim to be the Son of God, or to extinguish the hope forever. Thank you. Now, as the people assembled around the cave entrance and waited for the next event to take place, we have a very, very critical and serious issue because this was the event to prove or disprove the actual divinity of Jesus Christ. If Lazarus came forth, then he was the Son of God in fact. If he did not, then Christ was not the Son of God. True, there have been two, two prior resurrections to this one, Joris' daughter and the widow of Nan's son, but they happened in some obscure place where there were very few reliable and expert witnesses to verify the fact of it. And now as Christ came down toward the end of his ministry, he desired to reach, if possible, the hardest heart of the nation by giving them a living demonstration of his, of his power to, to save and to restore. And so Christ performed this great miracle. It should not have been necessary because when Christ brought about the conversion of a sinful soul, that in itself is a resurrection to newness of life, is it not? And the spiritual resurrection is just as meaningful, just as effective, just as uh, proving as is the physical. Lazarus came forth at the call of Christ and the gospel then was assured to us to the end of time. We're going to have to Revelation chapter 21 and 22 and look for a moment at the glorious future when there should be no more death, no sorrow, no crying for all these things will have passed away eternally. It's going to be good to go up to heaven and find there'll be no more sickness, no more death, no more termination of life, but nothing but endless and glorious prosperity. Revelation 21, I think, no, 22. We'll take first of all verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Service shall serve. There should be no more curse. Then what basically is the curse? Sin. Sin, right? And it's a tenant uh, curse which of course is death. Uh, I've got another scripture here which says there'll be no more death in the sorrow of crying. Is this it quickly, please? Yes, it's uh, 21 and verse 3 and down to verse 5. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 
Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. There shall be no more death. Happy prospects. No more partings, no more sorrow, no more loss. No more looking forward to a short lifespan, but an eternity of living with the Lord in glory. Now, we're blessed, of course, beyond simply having God's promise here. We also have his demonstration, as we just read in the case of Lazarus' resurrection. But better still is the fact that in your own person you know the power of this promise because you have been delivered from the power of sin or from spiritual death. And that deliverance is the assurance of eternal life that God does have the power, in fact, to banish death and bring in life in the place of death. We look forward to the great resurrection day. We shall hopefully meet Sister Stock again and enjoy with her the glories of paradise restored. May God bless each one. To this end is my prayer tonight. We may have a short song service. Kimber, would you like to lead out, please? Then we'll have our evening study. There's a card in circulation we'd like you to sign. A sympathy card. Yeah, it's, it's circulating around. Uh, who's got it? Right here. Has everyone had a chance to sign? Yeah, they have.